favorite part of the show right there is the clapping if you <laughs> makes you feel excited ready to go yeah <laughs> so keyword crypto colin lemayhew thank hey. you so much for joining us man how are you doing oh i'm doing pretty good yeah thanks for having me on here good to talk with other crypto enthusiasts yeah so i you said you said that you um but before we started recording you said that you had heard an episode of our show but i wanted to i wanted to give you but I'm, I'm mostly going to let you talk because I'm sure the mm-hmm. listeners want to hear want to hear what you have to say and they want to know what's up with NanoCoin. Um, but I wanted to give an introduction to you about what Nano means to this show and kind of how we got to Perfect. where we are. Absolutely. We started this two years ago. We started this podcast because we were invested in crypto, but and we knew we we're going to be in it for the long haul. But we were still kind of unsure about a lot of it, how it worked, and if it was even a viable thing. Like, we had a lot of issues with Bitcoin. We had a lot of issues with other mm-hmm. crypto. And so that's what we we just started talking to people. We talked to other founders. We talked to Vitalik. We talked to Jackson Palmer of Dogecoin. We talked to a lot of technicians as well as a lot of pundits in this space to try to figure out, like, answer some questions, stuff about economics, stuff about technology. And to this day, we still have some big issues Hmm. with BTC and a lot of other crypto. And oftentimes when we'd have somebody on this show, we'd use an example from the altcoin world, right? Mm-hmm. And and often it would be <laughs> Nano because Nano is 100% free. So we like, why don't we use the free example? Because we have an issue with Bitcoin being slow and expensive. Like people yeah. in the world are not going to be able to use something that is that is too expensive. So let's let's talk about this free free to transact coin nano and when we did that it was like we got mocked for for picking this one oh, no. quote unquote shit coin yeah and and we started to do it i mean michael actually knows a little bit about nano so he, he used that as an example and it became a running joke almost it became a meme Oh no, I hope that is not a joke. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, no, it, it was actually great because I mean I it almost sometimes it made me embarrassed that we were like, oh, we're talking about nano again. Oh my gosh, like how did we get yeah. here? And and a lot of our, you know, a lot of our listeners would kind of tease us about, you know, being nano shills or whatever when it was just something that came up on the show. Mm-hmm. At one point, Carbon Base felt attacked because I, I brought up Nano and he didn't know anything about it. Oh, <laughs> so. no. He, yeah, it was like, you know, we used that as an example and he'd be like, oh, is this some illiquid shitcoin that no one uses and and all yeah. this stuff. So so I don't know, but maybe it was, when did we start using Nano as a as a meme? Maybe about uh, like a year, year yeah, and a half ago. probably a year ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, a long time. And, and, and since then... We not only have like learned more about what Nano is, but we've also got more listeners and more followers that are kind of loyal Nano fans, which has been really cool. Now we've got these, mm-hmm. you know, the Nano Reply guys on Twitter yeah. that, uh, that jump in and <laughs> they are there. Know, yes, know, <laughs> and that's cool. So now we've got this kind of forum where we can talk about crypto, and we've you're you created nano you're the founder so that's where we are that's why we're excited to have you on the show to both legitimize this project that you've been working on for five years now is it yeah uh, 2014 i guess that's six years now it's going up there yeah and also and also because i i feel like we both kind of mention it in certain ways and some people admit their error you know they tell us like oh we're cringing when you say xyz because it's kind of true but not a hundred percent true mm. and and so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, really, I, I really wanted to have you on just for that reason to kind of like disseminate all the bad information from the good information and, and really kind of like uh, yeah. no, finalize absolutely. things for us. Absolutely. I mean, part of the reason why I really wanted to talk with you guys was um, kind of for a similar reason. It's because there's there's no end to the uh, you know number of podcasts or people that are out there for the purpose of shilling their coins essentially and that's it's not something that i'm interested in um i think our our team is not particularly interested in that too it's really the concepts behind it that we're interested in so yeah Yeah. i read 
I listened through your one podcast and I was super excited that it seemed like you guys feel the same. We we don't review coins on this show. We don't. I mean, if anything, we kind of tear some of them apart because we, you know, we're skeptical. We're skeptics, yeah. basically. So while this is so, so we'll do that with you. Just, yeah. just, just, be, just be, be one. <laughs> well, I, I I would go so far. I mean, I wouldn't call this. This isn't going to be a debate, but we probably will try to challenge you on some things. So, That's okay. I mean, as long it. as we're uh, having constructive and we're not. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Actually, we're, yeah. I mean, we're both excited to have you here. Um, we, so yeah. I, we, we I've, I have some questions and then we have a bunch of uh, Twitter questions that we can get to the end and kind sure. of do like a little bit of a speed round if you're cool with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did, did you want to start off question wise, JJ? Nope. You do it. All right. So once and for all, <laughs> it's nano POS <laughs> because every Bitcoin person is always like, well, you know, it's not going to work. because It's proof of stake. So, and I yeah. keep on saying it's, it's not actually proof of stake. Well, you know, it's not going to work. It's like you guys just r- do two seconds of reading. It's not proof yeah. of stake. So can you once and for all, just tell us what it is. So we, we use a different term, open representative voting. And it's, it's not just because we wanted to apply a new name to a thing. It's because, when you talk about proof of stake, it has all these connotations around it, specifically um, leader selection and um, block generation. And we don't do either of those. Um, well, so it is voting kind of like how proof of stake votes. Um, it's it's not like a staking method. It isn't a situation where the rich get richer um, or, or things like that. So I think it's a good distinction to have open representative voting. Nice. So anytime there's voting, there's the possibility for centralization. And I know that is something that is coming dangerously close again because now that Binance runs a node and the big mm. exchanges and that can lead to centralization. Is that a possibility? What's the danger of it? How do you combat that with something like Nano where there is no reward and there's no um, reason to encourage uh, yeah. So with with normal staking, obviously you want to get the most rewards as a user. So you want to go to a place that's trustworthy and that's going to, you know, have have big pull and stuff like that, and ha- and give you a high uh, percentage on ret- of, of return. Mm-hmm. So how do you avoid all that since that's not really an issue with with uh, with DPoS? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I think um, the our, our goal is very much decentralization. I mean, there's there's not a point in making a um, centralized currency, especially when there's no rewards on it. It's You're essentially going to a database or um, a single entity to do it. Decentralization is very much an interest to ours, not just um, not just paying lip service to that. The, the vision that I have on it is in the future, um, if the goal for Nano is to be a globally used currency. Um, and if we look at where people store currency now, we don't have a situation where everyone stores it in a single bank. There's lots of banks all over the world. Some people keep currency, you know, under a mattress or on the digital equivalent would be on your own computer. I think in the future, it's, it's not going to be a situation where we have everyone uh, owning and holding on an exchange where they can, you know, easily purchase or sell it in, in a later situation. So I think, the, the current state of how things are, like the Binance um, plus the couple other um, providers that it's delegate our weight is delegated to, I think that is more um, an observation of what we need to fix. And it's we need to fix um, like adoption and liquidity. So I think we need to get it used in more places. And when I, when I think it's actually being used by people that storage is not going to be on exchanges like that. Real quick, I, I just wanted to say something because we mm-hmm. jumped into a, a relatively complicated question mm-hmm. is that Nano is, it's uh, it's not mined. It's uh, it's basically supported by by people running wallets or nodes. So there's no, yeah. it's, there's no proof of work. It's, it's not, you're, you're saying you don't call it proof of stake. Um, and the other thing that, that, sets nano apart from other cryptocurrencies is that it's virtually fee or is it completely f- fee 
just so that the people who are listening who don't know everything about crypto already know what we're talking gotcha. about. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this it, inside of Nano, there's there's not a fee in the transaction. So you're not paying inside the transaction in order to do it. There is there's a cost associated with it. Um, there's a there's a technology cost when you generate a transaction. Your computer does have to do, or some computer has to do a proof of work in order to to publish the transaction. Um, so in that aspect, it's not you know free, but there is no really such thing as free. Everything has an opportunity cost. Um, but the the actual user is not confronted with having to put a fee into it. So really, in okay. my mind, um, I'll just say like in my mind, I don't. It's it's more of a usability thing as to why we don't want to put the fee inside the block there's a there's a couple other technical reasons why we want to do that but did you have a question first oh no i just wanted to say that so the in regards to um the centralization question the the reason that you're not worried about centralization is because there's no incentive to to stake or mine like no no one gets any reward for that so it wouldn't make sense to to centralize to try to to try to gain uh, a large percentage of of the whatever you'd call it, the stake. Yeah, exactly. I, I did write like a short um, medium article about this a couple of years ago, and it um, I think it was pretty well received. But it was about economies of scale on on that type of thing. If there is some sort of reward mechanism in the network, there's always going to be people trying to maximize that, and that's going to be um, consumed by people that know how to use economies of scale. And so, like in the proof of proof of work Nakamoto world. That's the mining farms. That's the mining facilities. In proof of stake, that's going to be some large holder of nano, like the exchanges um, that have a lot of it. Their their economy of scale is that your money is opportunity lost, co- um, locked up in their platform. Okay, so that's that's the that's the basis of how nano works. So if you've been listening this far and you understand that, then that's then that's great. And if not, <laughs> then I don't know how much you're going to get out of this interview. But <laughs> there we go. We'll we'll get to more we'll uh, social issues yeah. and stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, we'll we'll get to some fun stuff at the end for sure. <clears throat> from uh, from a from a developer standpoint, do you feel that um, helping to avoid centralization is something that you should be responsible for on your end? Because from my standpoint, I just feel like it's such an easy wallet fix that. You know, when when they're when a wallet's like when Natrium's list of representatives, mm-hmm. um, if one of them starts to reach above like thirty percent, it should just drop that to the bottom of the list, and just yeah. make it, and then you know, force people to kind of like out of sight, out of mind. They just don't even they don't want to scroll down through a hundred and find Binance all the way at the bottom, so they just use the one at the top, which is another one that had a great one that has like one percent or something like that. Yeah, I mean, or is that, that- something you feel you should do? No, not not really. Like, I mean, there there are maybe some things we can do to um, cut out outliers or deal with edge situations. But um, on principle, we don't want to influence that thing because we are focused on centralization. If we're we're curating a list of you know representatives and presenting it as Nano Foundation, then uh, if you trace it back, essentially what Nano Foundation is doing is controlling the representative list. So we we've really been stepped back from making that type of list. We've never actually made that list. All of the lists that exist for representatives, their scoring are all um, community created. Um, and you can pick whichever one you want. Um, I, I think one of the goals in Natrium is to, is to do that thing. I mean, there, there might be some improvements to do to change it automatically, especially if you're um, an apathetic user and haven't explicitly set your own, maybe it'll on your next transaction, change the representative. Um, that type of thing would be interesting. Yeah, there's just, definitely just room to, for improvement. Just to clarify, you did you mean decentralized when you said the Nano Foundation is focused on? Yeah, decentralization. decentralization? Oh, okay. did I say the opposite? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's let's uh, audio edit that one. <laughs> what What is an apathetic user? That's an interesting term. Um, well, it's, yeah, it's it's kind of like apathetic voter, or it's just a user that doesn't understand the representative mechanism. Um, I see. One of our other philosophies is to make all of this as easy as possible. It's par- that's partly what leads into our fee discussion is mm-hmm. what does a fee mean? Part of it's the minimum fee and then part of it's like a prioritization fee. When the user has to think about this, like it, it just doesn't make them feel good. They don't have to calculate the transaction fees in a 
usual basis. If you're sending a wire transfer, you do whatever, but as one of our big criticisms of crypto is like, why do we even call this a, a, a private key? It's like a weird, we, we even have weird terminology for these things. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're looking at that exact same thing. Um, it, yeah, you want to figure out what the user understands and what is meaningful to them semantic wise in the words that we use. It's all a, like a branding exercise. I mean, at some point, don't you want the entire world to be an apathetic user though or do you want them to fully understand representatives and making sure they're picking representatives Um, that's a good question yeah that's a good question because like that's essentially how much do you want the the people what the people of the world to understand money or even possibly yeah or do you want it just to work and and they you know they don't have to think about it yeah, I mean, I, I kind of want that situation. I kind of want it to just work. So we are dealing with a situation where we're trying to really court these apathetic users. Maybe apathetic's not the word. It's, but it, it, you know, it's the users that will never be interested or possibly capable of understanding what the representative is. It's like there's tons of stuff that I don't know in the world, and some people are just not going to understand how finance representatives work. It's just how it is. But I think that goes back to where do people store their money? A lot of people store it in banks. And if, you know, banks have a procedure or like a policy where they use their own representative, which they should, they're a bank, um, most people do store the majority of their money in banks. And then the only time a user is kind of going to be responsible for it is when they have a, like a wallet on their phone. And that's going to be for smaller amounts, like daily transactional amounts. So you see Nano being kind of like people storing it in banks in the future like we do now yeah i i think so because i mean i i think the important part is that it gives the possibility for people to not use the banking system you don't need to participate in banks but i think realistically as people go on the banks provide two things they provide security keeping the thing secure so they have all the like guards and all of the it policies to keep that part of it secure but they also ensure so if I keep my um, seed in my house and my house burns down, if it's written on paper, that's going to be destroyed. Whereas if it's in a bank, you know, they have insurance and then the insurance policies will hopefully pay it out. Um, and I don't so foresee then, that ever disappearing. So then how do you, um, I mean, as soon as we have banks, we're going to have promissory notes. Mm-hmm. So how how would that work with Nano? Because the only way they can insure something feasibly is by having complete control over it and giving you a promissory note for it. Right. And yeah. I mean, spend would, that promissory note. Well, it would be on deposit with their bank, and then you would spend it either through like a secure mechanism, which indicates to them that you want to spend it. I mean, it's it would be a card situation. Or however we do it currently, but hmm. in the back Paper end, money. yeah, Paper I mean, money that it, represents Nano. Yeah, exactly. But I, I think the important part is this: is this isn't to get away from the the core principle of um, cryptocurrency, which is right now we don't have an option to get out of that system. There is no opt out strategy for the banking system. You have to be inside of it. Whereas this kind of flips it around, where it's saying this is the currency that the world uses, and you can also put it into a bank if you so choose. Now, could you feasibly see it being like a new, a, di- a different type of gold standard where it, it we're not using nano anymore? We're using some kind of printed digital promissory note instead, and that runs in, and that runs instead of nano that's stored in the bank, and that's how people are insuring everything. Um, I I don't just pres- I I ask that because I yeah. don't ever foresee um, uh, government fiat ever disappearing because the ability to for a country to control its own monetary system is something that I don't think any powerful country is ever going to give up. Uh, yeah, they're certainly not going to want to. That's that's for sure. Um, I I mean to the question I think about, you know, issuance of notes or prom- promissory notes, the, the main one of the main factors aside from the ability to con- do monetary policy in the currency is there is the control and enforcement of counterfeiting in there on that currency. So if you're using dollars in some part of the, of the world where um, there aren't strong um, anti-counterfeiting measures, you might 
it, it's possible for people to start counterfeiting this and then start feeding it into the system. So that's that's just a per, that's going to be a perpetual problem with any sort of physical note issuance of things. But that's a problem that cryptocurrency solves. It's just the double spending problem. So I, it, it, with with that with that in your mind, every different region is going to have to enforce this in a country specific way on how to prevent these notes from being counterfeited in the different ways. And I don't know if people will opt for a local currency um, that their government issues when, when they're present, when the default position is that we already have a global currency right now. It, it seems very hard for people to get out of their government currency because that's how the world is built and that's how it operates. We use the government's currency, but in a world where we're using cryptocurrency and then all of a sudden the government comes out and says, Hey, we're issuing these promissory notes. Um, that's going to look a little, I think people's opinion would change on that a little bit. I don't know. I guess I don't have a perfect answer on that one. That's okay. It's, I mean, we're all, it's brand new <laughs> stuff. We're, that, we're I think that's the first, that's the first time we've ever like even, entertain that idea that that cryptocurrency being world currency in the future but we still have banks that do the sort of uh you know that take care of it for you which is probably you need custodial services for sure right now it's way too hard yeah it's realistic and i think most people in the crypto space aren't aren't being realistic and aren't being honest with themselves yeah uh, i mean there's so many cases in the real world where you need custody of money that are just simply not going to go away and a lot of it goes around um, like the ability pr- to provide escrow. Also, if you're doing a situation, let's say you're going to buy a bunch of clothes from uh, overseas, you, usually they require a certain amount of, money to be, amount of money to be put up in escrow before that goes off. Um, so that that's a situation where somebody else is holding on to your money. And you know, any of these situations when you're selling a house or buying a house, you put the money in escrow. So there's always going to be a case for custody, especially when you're transmitting a physical asset and you need to verify that. It, you know, the transaction's gone through on the physical side. So let's, I'm going to transition to one user question mm-hmm. about, um, just because this is important. It's it's in a similar vein. I think it is Bourbon on Twitter. Um, he said, in the past, you've dunked on DeFi, saying it solves no business case mm-hmm. anyone is looking for. I'm guessing he wouldn't uh, he's saying about you. I'm guessing he would say it's more important the base currency is properly usable and decentralized rather than the finance component, but you just brought up a really important finance component of escrow and loans and housing and um is is your is your opinion on DeFi changing? Uh I, I don't think it is. I mean it, it- the, the the word decentralized is in the in the DeFi acronym, and it kind of depends on what people want to consider decentralized. But the the end problem is that any sort of and all these DeFi products are built on top of a smart contract system, and ignoring you know all the technicals on how that works and to what degree it works and better. The end the end situation is that the technology itself, the data itself, can't sample the outside world so it can't figure out who is owning something or who possesses something and it can't cause something to happen in the world like it can't move a car to another location or move a house title to someone else it they they try to work around it you know with oracles um, which are essentially notary services Um, whether or not people would you want to use those notary services as opposed to traditionally notary, notary services i don't i don't see them moving to you know like oracle systems and i don't think anyone's really solved the how do you make something happen in the real world um when something happens in a smart contract that like you can't move a physical property the only thing you can do is move a balance inside the system so that's why you see all these smart contract um apps the dapps a vast majority of them are gambling apps where the output is moving where the money goes because that's the only thing they can actually ensure happens they can ensure that money has moved they can't ensure really anything else and i'm assuming that that's not something you want to have running on i mean in in physically can't run on nano at any point right now right yeah it's it's not designed we don't have a smart contract system um i mean you can inject little bits of data here and there Uh, people have attempted it but we 
we don't support it. But it's this this question of is this a uh, something that Nano should solve inside of the base layer, or is this something that goes on top of it and separate? My opinion, you know, I could be wrong about DeFi, but to the extent that I'm wrong on whether or not it'd be successful, I do think it would have to be a separate system. I don't think it should be integrated directly into the currency layer. Um, so I, I, if they were asking my advice on where to put it, I would say you, you don't want to put it inside the currency itself. And is Nano something that can have a second layer? Um, well, it, it, yeah, it, de- it depends on what you're trying to do. If the second layer depends on smart contracts, um, it, it doesn't have that in there, like programmability. If your second layer is more just akin to a, a payment system that uses Nano as a currency, um, it can do that. You don't get the the guaranteed like money spend at the end of the contract, but um, yeah, I guess that's the compromise you have to do. So I mean, it, it would be hard to do something like the Lightning. You you could not do the Lightning Network on Nano currently without okay. smart contracts. Um, I'm just gonna keep jumping around because. Yeah. You're mm-hmm. you're you have, you're answering stuff really quickly. Um, if, a few minutes ago, you said uh, it solves a double spend problem. So, can you talk about double spend on Nano and kind of the hybridization of why you have kind of proof of work and proof of stake at the same time? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, our we do have proof of work in there that goes. What what that's used for is. Um, throttling the rate at which transactions can be sent to the network. So there's a certain minimum amount of uh, computation that needs to be done, th- proved through proof of work in order to simply publish a transaction. And it also um, provides a secondary mechanism for us, which is prioritiz- prioritization of how the um, representatives will vote on this block. So in a situation where you know we're saturated um, we've reached the maximum capacity of how the network's set up. We need to prioritize who goes first, and then we use the proof of work difficulty in order to prioritize that. And that one, we do it one because it's easy because we already use it as a transaction mechanism. But it's also one; it's malleable with respect to the signature. You can apply new proof of work if it's higher difficulty, um, and you can also do what is essentially a replace by fee without needing to re-sign the block and make a new, or without re-signing the transaction and make a new transaction. So that, those, those things are how our proof of work um, is used in Nano, but noticeably it does not really, it doesn't influence the consensus. It doesn't influence the double spend part. The double spend part is, um, the consensus is generated by votes that are broadcast to the network, their flood is the network, and the vote is weighted by um, the representative weight. So how much balance has been delegated to this representative and their vote is weighted in the in the tally by that amount. Does that kind of give a good line or I'm gonna I'm not going to lie. I didn't really understand any of that. Oh, sorry. (laughs) No, no, no. But that was a question mainly for the Bitcoin audience who's kind of implied that um, they don't see how it could work. And so I wanted to have that on record so I can kind of point back to them. So like this, no, this is directly from Colin that this is the explanation. Um, Because I think that Bitcoin people will understand that. Like the people who are smart enough or people who are... Um, technical enough to yeah, to dig ask it. that question are going to understand that. So I just kind of wanted to have that on record. Gotcha. So sorry, everybody who didn't understand any of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the past, people have said it's still in beta. Don't worry about it. And then mm-hmm. I've said that on the podcast, and people are like, "Stop saying it's in beta. It's not in beta anymore." <laughs> and so I'm like, "Okay, is it in beta?" Is it not in beta? No, so no all no. cryptocurrency in beta is the question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> kind of to a certain extent. Uh, no, I mean, our live network has been running since 2015, um, since we turned it on. And okay. it's been going ever since. So it's it's live. Um, so why have people, co- I mean, I, I mean, it, it obviously it's not, I mean, obviously it's live, so it's not technically in beta, but I think people were implying that there's still so much on the to-do list to get solved that it's 
Yeah. You know, it's kind of like how, how Gmail was in beta for 10 years. And then, you know, oh, that's like true, three yeah. years ago, they finally pulled the beta <laughs> moniker. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you, part, if I were to guess, I would guess um, this probably comes from the the marketing crowd of people where that ask when we're going to like start chilling nano and start, you know, getting <laughs> on stage in front of a big screen and, and yelling about how great it is. Um, so we uh, have kind of like, we, we hold them back on that because that's, that's not what we think will make a cryptocurrency work. We don't think that that's going to push it out in general to a certain extent. You want to get your name out. You definitely want to get adoption from businesses. Um, but we don't need to be getting on stage and spending money on airdrops and all and all this type of stuff. So they they think that this reservation because no, we're going to focus on the the technical parts of this and do this in a strategic rollout. They see it. Oh well, since you're not doing that, it must be still in beta. But it's not. It's live. <laughs> okay. So I, that this takes me to my next question then. A couple of years ago, I was in the Discord, the Nano Discord, mm-hmm. and I was chatting with um, one of the mods. You who, were in the Nano you know, Discord two years ago? Yeah. Wow, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, I had some questions about the wallet, and so someone said, "This because I was using the dev wallet mm-hmm. um, back when BitGrail was Oof. a thing. Oh, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And uh, so I got, into, I got into it that way. And also, this was, this was my transition from IOTA to Nano just because... The IOTA uh, community was just so toxic; I couldn't handle it. And, so and you, were said, oh, tr- for, you were looking for you were looking for free, free. You were looking for free, right? Free transactions. Um, I was looking for fast and working. Yeah, <laughs> you were you, you know, were at IOTA. <laughs> yo, so well, I mean, IOTA was the first one, and then people were like, and it was just so toxic. I was like, this is horrible. And they're like, uh, and someone was like, oh, you should try Nano instead. And then it's like, it's like, wow, this community is so chill and polite and nice yeah. even the reply guys like the joke about the reply guys is they're just really nice people yeah <laughs> they're not i mean they're shilling nano but they're shilling the technology they're not shilling the nut like the price so yeah it's, it's interesting um what is like oh, go, go ahead. i was gonna say that is one thing that we've um eliminated for most of our uh like foundation channels like discord and the reddit since we we don't talk about price in fact that's one of the you'll get deleted offenses on our thing just because oh, really? it's not, yeah, it, it's not bringing anything productive yeah. into the discussion, you know, speculating about what the price is going to be tomorrow. doesn't, doesn't make it so, and it's, it's really distracting. So I, I think that rule you, has really been helpful. You actually censor people in, in your forums for talking about it, price. It, we <laughs> sorry we pick, to use the word censor. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's a bit loud. <laughs> that, I mean, we, there, there are other places. We, we point, point him to another um, subreddit that is specifically for t- discussing nano price um, or <laughs> that, an alternative cool. discard. You guys talk about price <laughs> yeah. over here. Well, no, that, that's, a, that's a smart thing to do because you don't want it in your conversations about making a cryptocurrency. Like, yeah. And also, you guys, you guys did censor back then people who were like openly racist and posting clan stuff or oh, yeah. you know Pepe me. No. And I feel bad about this because because we've had Joe on now and um and and talked about Pepe, but like people were starting to try to use Pepe in a white supremacist type of way. Mm. And I know you guys were you guys locked that down fast. Yeah, you guys were like deleting people left and right. So well, that's that, what I really appreciated about the network, about that, the Discord group. That is a really important aspect of any like network, open source network. You have to be really careful about who starts Absolutely. to use it. So that's just like, I mean, yeah, that's one thing that we all have to do if you're creating a network that anybody can use. You don't want this to become Nazi money. No, exactly. Yeah. And it's like, you, although the protocol is open and anyone can connect to it and by design, we can't prevent anyone from using it. Um, uh, on the flip side of that, we don't have to allow them to post their junk on our forums or, you know, whatever. And we definitely don't allow yeah. that. So we, we are under, we never present the illusion that we're not going to censor that type of thing. We will absolutely remove it from our channels, but if those guys want to use the network, um, we, we can't stop them just because it's an open protocol, yeah. you know? Yeah. So when I was talking with the, with the dev and this, and granted this is two years ago, um, he said, Colin's a genius, <laughs> but you know, worst case what? scenario and being very like dark here, if he got hit by a bus tomorrow, Nana would collapse hmm. just because it's all in his head. And so two years later, I know you've hired more people. I know you've, 
really try to branch it out a little bit, but do you still have stuff locked in your head? Like if, if <laughs> something were to happen to you, would nano really kind of falter? Or do you feel like it's at a point now where it can survive on its own and you have a solid team that can pick up the slack or anybody randomly, yeah. if the project just died like two years ago, could just pick it up again and just start running with it? Yeah. Well, I, it's a good question. I think that there's still work to be done on that. I think that it is possible for someone to do that now because everything is open source um, and it, everything that we've done would still exist and it, it works really well in its current form. Um, but obviously there's just a practicality standpoint of if I'm not around or if the entire team isn't around, who is actually going to pick it up and continue using it? Uh, I And I think that comes with adoption, really. The more this gets integrated with more businesses and the more people use it, um, they have technical people that are going to start to learn it and more and more people will, um, start to be participating in a meaningful way towards, you know, code commits, um, and and things like that. What are the other, uh, since Nano is free to transact, what are the other free cryptos? Do we even know what they are? IOTA, which is we can make fun of IOTA for not really working very well, but do you do you know who your competitors are? Yeah, I mean, it's surprising how few people put literally no fees inside their network. Um, I don't, I can't think of another one. I know there's a lot of them that do very low fees, and you know those are very low, but there's not many people focusing on absolutely zero. And is I mean, that because doesn't, doesn't Tron do free if it's wallet to wallet? And then I, my response to them was, "Isn't all, aren't all transfers wallet to wallet? <laughs> it's like, yeah. how would you do it any other way? And the person just didn't reply to me after Tron, that. <laughs> Tron specific wallets probably is what they meant. But like, but I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think that's a, that's a pretty good question is like, why make it that? So the, I, the point of having a fee is to not just be some money for the network of the developers or for the incentive or whatever. And we can start talking about incentives because that's actually a big issue with um, with Nano. But yeah, why are, aren't there more free cryptocurrencies if it's possible? I, I don't know. I mean, my, my feeling on it is I think it, I have a little bit of a pessimistic view about that one. I, I actually think that it's because of the reasons why a lot of people get into this. And I think a lot of people that are getting into it are doing it specifically to make money themselves uh and and i think that the fee kind of just leads into that um or or people just don't want to get creative with figuring out how to make it a technology problem rather than a user problem most people who get interested in finance and money are in it because they want to make (laughs) money that's true yeah (laughs) yeah which isn't necessarily (laughs) a a bad it's not necessarily a bad reason. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, yeah, if you want to, um, if you want to make a new money, then you should probably become rich from it if it ends up being a great money. So, yeah, um, it's true. I, I mean, I think everyone that wants to, you're right. People want to make money on this. I think the important difference is that inside the currency itself is that um, have, making money it like the currency is not a business. It's more like a tool or a standard. It's a standard measurement of value rather than like a revenue generating business. I mean, on the technical yeah, aspect, go ahead. I was going to say on a technical aspect, since Nano doesn't have a leader selection, it's it would be hard for us to assign the recipient of a fee at any given time. Um, so that that's another thing. Can you explain leader selection? Yes. So the way that a lot of cryptocurrencies are designed is they will pick a single or roughly they'll pick a single entity at a given point in time to decide consensus on the network. And that person's called a leader and nano doesn't do that because we um, accept votes from all the representatives for all the transactions. So if you're taking in a fee in a leader model, you just assign the fee or whatever was paid to the person that was leading at that point in time. In Nano, since everyone's participating, you'd have to like divide it up and then send it around to all of them in small fractions or something. Should we talk about uh, uh, incentives or should we talk about inflation deflation? 
I think inflation deflation Ooh, is going to be a heavy, heavy, heavy is, oh, yeah. okay, that's a heavy one. So <laughs> this is one of um, our one of our big issues with uh, with with Bitcoin is the deflationary model, um, and that 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 economic model does not in, it doesn't it's not conducive to money that people use as a currency. It's mm-hmm. conducive to to hodling and storing. So, Michael, what's your what's your what's your uh, specific question about this, or do you have one? I just, I mean, you know, we've talked to a lot of, not to a lot, we've talked to a um, economist and I've talked to more on Twitter and, it, you know, deflationary death spirals are a danger for any society and it happened in Japan um, back during their recession. And mm-hmm. how, do you, how do you see it just not being an issue with with nano with a hard cap you know it's like yeah how, how do you make yeah, sure so if anybody doesn't this? know so if anybody doesn't know so actually so can you explain how nano was created and 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 the hard cap and all that before you before we get into that oh yeah sure um yeah because our uh distribution mechanism was pretty unique so we um put all of our money out through a free faucet and we distrib- we're distributing that at a fixed rate over two years so how, you know, most of these currencies go out, they go to miners or people with capital investment, and then they're the only ones that receive more of these rewards and rewards back um, in order to distribute the currency. We kind of flipped on the side and said, we're going to give this all out for free, but in order to get the Nano, what you're going to have to do is solve a Google CAPTCHA. And based on how many of those you solve is how much of the proportion of the Nano that you get during that one hour period um, when we divided it up. So we did that for um, two years and distributed it out. And then the remaining amount, so the total amount was in the Genesis block. We distributed um, 133 million out through this this faucet. And then the remaining we um, burned in order to get a fixed supply. So that's how we arrived at 133 million roughly. So how do you, how do you see how do you see money with a with a fixed supply working as a currency in the future? Because it's really hard to imagine an economy that works that way. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a couple things that get conflated here. So there's there's the inflationary deflationary aspect of the currency itself, in that it, in its either total supply or its circulating supply. But then there's from a a whole macroeconomy standpoint, there's economic economy scale deflation and inflation and those factors aren't net um necessarily or even majority driven by the currency's inflation so things like increases it like in productivity or uh decreases in aggregate demand can all cause a deflation in your economy but that's not necessarily because the money itself deflated and i think that that those that specific part has been conflated a lot And I I think it's been conflated, especially to a large degree by central banks and currency issuers, because it it partially justifies their inflationary model of putting out currency. They need it to be justified. They need to have a reason to inflate it. So if they use the the narrative that deflationary spirals are fatal, which they're, they're very, very bad, people, they can kind of skip over the fact that, well, was it the currency deflating that caused it or was it aggregate demand or supply that caused that doesn't i mean doesn't a deflationary currency though just lead to people not wanting to use it uh i mean i don't i don't think so Uh, people use currency not every single person that i i guess like put it this way if you get paid in a job in a currency does your desire to spend what you just were paid really hinge on the inflation or deflation percentages of what it is or is it just going to go to rent because you have to pay rent at the end of the month yeah but if i can hold off on paying rent to the last possible second because the value of my nano is going to go up yeah if you got 1. paid 1.5x if you got paid i'm going to wait to the last possible i'm going to wait to the last possible second same with food same with a, a washer sure. same with you know I mean, so if anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, um, there's two examples, one inflationary, one deflationary. So 
in Japan during their, their recession, people didn't want to spend money because the value of their money was increasing over time. And so it just stopped them from actually going out and buying anything. Because if I had a thousand, if I had a thousand yen today, I could buy five washing machines, but the value increased and tomorrow I could buy six. So there's no reason for me to buy it today when I can get it for cheaper tomorrow. Unless you and don't have a we washer. Have the inflation. Yeah. yeah, unless you don't have a washer. But if you can hold off it so so what that does is that kind of slows down an economy and 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 decreases sales and and lowers your GDP and and that's well, why they call it a, a deflationary death spiral. I, well, I think we need to kind of, I, I don't know the answer on this, but I think we do need to figure out the causal direction on it. Um, because if, if you look at it from the other direction, if there is some sort of large impact on your economy where the, the outcome in the next few months is not necessarily certain, what you're going to cut is discretionary purchasing. And that's going to, be manifest as a deflation in in the average currency price because your um, aggregate demand has dropped. So and it, and and it's not to say that we don't have that in our country where we have inflation where we're if as soon as we start to see a recession, all the banks, all the lenders, they just kind of clam up and stop loaning money. Yeah, you know. So we we it's not something that is is that only happens in. Def- deflationary currency models or deflation, you know, we or can system. control or, it here. That's the difference. Is with that's interest that's rates. the point. And I think so. And and the thing about inflation is, and from my understanding, the point of inflation and allowing it to occur is because the population increases. So if you're so if your population is increasing at like one percent, you want your money supply to increase at one percent, so the money, so the value of the money stays roughly the same across the board. Well, that's if you need to maintain the same price levels. But if you, I mean that that's part of the the thing that I I think it's a little bit over focused on because really what matters is the rate of deflation and inflation. If it's imperceptible at any given at any given interval. It doesn't matter if it's less than zero, greater than zero, but small, or if it is actually, in fact, zero. Um, what matters is how fast the, the inflation deflation shock happens. It, and then, and the reason for that is, you know, if we look at our prices today for everything, um, goods, services, and especially salaries, if we just added a zero to everything, that's you know, the number's bigger. The number, the price is different, but it's all been achieved in lockstep. If you inflate or deflate slowly, the, the prices will go down, but also you know salaries will go down. Everything kind of goes down in lockstep if it's done slowly enough. It's a pretty good answer. I mean, yeah. You think about things so about I mean, that. I I guess the the real kind of like like really kind of pin you down on this question is sure. we haven't had deflationary currency ever in the history of the planet because gold supply wasn't gold supply was inflationary it was just very very small Mm -hmm. and we had we had gold standards in pretty much every single country so you couldn't print money and we had brutal histories of war which we have inflate we have now because people are greedy so i think that's that wouldn't change but since we've gone off the gold standard, we've we've seen the greatest technological advance in the history of humankind in mm-hmm. the shortest amount of time. And I and I find it hard to believe that that the ability to print money on mass didn't have a drastic um, uh, effect on that. Like it like wasn't responsible for that. I just I find it I find it near impossible. Hmm. That the minute we go off the gold standard is the minute that within thirty years we go to the moon. Yeah, I mean thirty years. Yeah, it, I it, it's an interesting point. I, I think that we do, but I, I don't think that one caused the other necessarily. I, I think that they just happen to roughly coincide. the The time that we went off the gold standard in the U.S. is roughly the same time the transistor was invented, and that's where our technology spike came from more so than like slight tweaking of the 
inflation. I mean, I, I mean, when you have, when you have unlimited money, more or less, but you it, can it, advance technology at, a, at an, ex, at an extremely fast level, like fast pace. Because yeah, but like it, ultimately, ultimately when you're, when you're ex- experimenting on stuff, the, the, the money tends to be the thing slowing down advancement. But the money, you get to look at the, what the money's representative of the money, the money takes the position of future productivity. So like your economy has a fixed amount of things that can produce. It can only produce so many cars, buildings, blah, blah, blahs. Having more money in an area can, um, you know, entice people through demand in order to focus on a, a single area. Let, I mean, let's use the moon example when they funded basically gave NASA an unlimited budget to go to the moon for whatever reasons they, you know, they caused the economy to focus on that because they were able to, you know, funnel money into it, but there is an opportunity cost. It isn't that there's unlimited money. It's that we had to forego productive capacity in other parts of our economy. Was that right to do? Um, I don't I don't really know. Going to the moon is extremely expensive. If we would have waited 50 years, we could have done it far more cheap. Um, but we did get a lot of advancement out of it. So it depends on what, what the what the program they're investing is, really. Do we get return out of it? Equally so, just spending for the sake of spending doesn't um, doesn't create a productive capacity. Like if you pay someone to dig a hole and then refill the hole, they've achieved money, but nothing's really been done. It was, a, it was no productive output. And I think that that's where the unlimited money scenario, you have to be really, really careful with that. Um, because we can't just we can't just continuously print more money and say, oh, we're going to print money and assign this here, print money and assign this here. You can do that in small amounts. It goes back to this, like if it's imperceptible to people, you know, they'll they'll tolerate it. But if you do it in large, large amounts, then your money's can't has no future value. You can't save in it. Um, and if you can't save in it, you're going to instantly spend it. The demand for the currency itself is going to go down because it's not as useful as something that you can retain for a long time and have a fixed value in. Um, and then the currency's confidence is shattered. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm not encouraging uh, you know, mass sure mass printing of money because we. I think we. The perfect example is I. I read a stat or I heard a stat recently that something like ninety percent of the S and P five hundred doesn't have doesn't allocate a single dollar to R and D now, mm-hmm. which is just fucking. Yeah, that's crazy. Ridiculous and irresponsible that they're just taking all this money and all these buybacks and all this and, and doing and just not spending a single dollar on R and D. Yeah, that's mind blowing. So obviously, inflation at a certain point leads to a certain amount of greed where it, the economy kind of stops uh, being creative and 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 yeah. yeah. So I I feel like there's there's got to be that that. I don't know. I, I feel like there's got to be that that midway point, and I and I worry that that nano is an experiment not just with digital money, but with with economics, and I and that well, makes me a little nervous. When, when you're when you're talking about um, like the inflation deflation, do you mean in the um, like total amount that's in the economy, or are you? are you more meaning the amount that's in circulation? Cause like uh, central banking systems, they do two things that they broadly talk about as their uh, monetary policy. One is the actual issuing of new notes. And then the other one is um, purchasing or um, selling some other type of asset in order to either increase or decrease the circulating supply, but they haven't actually changed the number of notes that are issued. So I guess our like a, a central bank or some sort of banking system could do that that circulating supply type of thing. They could purchase um, like bonds or other assets with um, like with nano or whatever the currency is, and then resell them at a future point in time. The only thing they couldn't do is um, literally print new notes. Yeah, so I think it's the literally being able to print new notes because I feel like at a certain point. There's, there's, is, I mean, we've had a lot of pretty horrible wars in the last, you know, 70 years, but I think they all pale in comparison to World War One and World War Two, 
in the sense of just mass mm-hmm. scale and how wars were back then. And Absolutely. just, you know, people, people were invading for gold, for resources, for all these things. And we're still doing, I mean, we, I think we've only really technically had one war for resources in the last 60 years. Everything else was against communism, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, Iraq was pretty clearly an invasion for resources. And I think, but I think that's now at this point, that's kind of a rarity around the planet. Yeah. Well, it's fortunate. Hopefully it stays that way. I mean, we don't want actual water wars. I I mean, in in my mind, you know, I don't think that the, the wars at those time, I think the, the reason we had those wars at that time were because we didn't have as much productive capacity. So we were um, fighting more for the limited resources. I think technology has alleviated a lot of that. Um, whether or not that'll be sustainable, I don't really know, but I think that's why we're fighting a little bit less right now. Plus our ability to inflict damage on each other's has exceeded anything that's happened in history. Um, and I think we t- we've taken a step back after we realize what we can do to ourselves. Um, but I like wars, this, this goes back to the other thing. What is causing the economic macro deflation that's happening and wars are inherently destructive things. You're, you're destroying the productive capacity of the other country. So if, if people are fighting between each other, at the end of the war, when it's concluded, they're not going to be able to produce as much as they used to be. And when your production supply line on a supply demand curve goes left, decrease in supply, your, your prices are going to, or it goes down, your, your goes right, your prices are going to go down. Um, we're getting, we're getting deep. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that the, <laughs> the founder of Nano is thinking about uh, how, how world wars affect the economy. It's actually n- not enough people are talking about this, this kind of thing in crypto. Really, when t- totally, and, uh, yeah. and I think, I think, from what I can tell, in the, in what I, the information that I've gathered, it kind of does become a problem with any cryptocurrency that isn't controlled by humans in the end you know like the mm. the reason that we can protect against inflation or deflation is because we have a we have a government we, we elected people to decide whether to print or destroy money basically to keep mm-hmm. things level and when we introduce computer programs that are not going to be governed by humans or they're going to be go- governed very very little or very, in a limited way Mm-hmm. Um, I think that Ethereum, Ethereum doesn't have a hard cap because I think that they, there's, I don't, well, I don't know, this is probably oversimplifying things, but to preserve the ability to be able to change certain things that we might need to in terms of supply. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it sounds like you've thought a lot about this, which is good. Yeah. I mean, I, actually, so my, my main issue with inflationary things is um, when it's, when a human is controlling the inflation rate. So it's the central banking model. Um, They can pick what they think is a good time to do it for whatever reasons, and then put it in there. I don't, I don't really hate the algorithmic um, inflationary part. I I think it's unnecessary, which is especially in nano, I think it's unnecessary, but if you have sufficient liquidity, if you have sufficient people going in and out of a system that, that inflation rate, especially if it's low, is going to be largely priced in to um, what it is. And if it gets lower and lower over time, it, it goes back into that imperceptible realm. Um, so if it's fractions of a fractions of a percent inflation, but it's non-zero, um, I mean, in my opinion, that's essentially zero. I would, I would just call it zero after a certain point in time because it's, it's not noticeable. Yeah. So that's that's for the most part the questions I had. There's some user questions that um, tap into a couple of the other questions I had. So I guess okay. I, well, can I just ask? Like, can we just talk about one thing, and that is how uh, how how Nano the marketing works, and how you guys plan to to get to get stuff out into the world? Because without a monetary incentive to you know, there's there's no mining fee, so nobody's going to get rewards for for staking it or having a wallet. The only incentive is, say, if you're a business and you want to use this, then you'd run your own node. How do yeah. you guys approach that, and how does that blend in with your branding and getting the name out and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean that that was one thing that we it popped up. I mean, probably within the last year or so, we we realized 
um, how to more effectively market the, um, the representative list and, and being a, a representative. And what we found um, is that these services, businesses that are integrating into Nano are, are very interested in running principal representatives. So what you guys were talking about earlier, you know, like the wallets selecting a representative, there are a lot of places that aggregate um, who are the biggest representatives, what's their, what's their weight. And then they usually assign like a name to it of who this person is. Cause they're usually identifiable. And in fact, a lot of represent those guys want to be identified because it's a mark of status and it's, it's essentially free advertising. So we, we tell them, if you set up a representative, one, it's going to kind of signal to the community that you are interested in this and that you're making it a part of your business and your name can, is going to be on this list. If you're sufficiently good at convincing people that you're reputable, you know, and your representative stays up, we're measuring how, what your uptime is, you're going to go up on this list. And when you're up on this list, people are, you're going to get eye time on your brand. Um, and they, they love that. All they have to do is set up a machine keep it running for, you know, 24 seven, it costs $50, $100, depending on how much per month, depending on how much you want to spend on it. And they get their brand on Nano's representative list. So we've actually been pretty successful with that on, on that specific route. That's pretty cool that you guys have figured that so, something like that yeah, out yeah. and you might, you might have a solution for, uh, uh, adoption really, because yeah. I mean, you guys have a free fast, cryptocurrency why isn't everyone using it already like this it's probably because it's just hard to market these things when there's thousands of them and that just getting adoption and getting businesses to use this or users interested yeah yeah i mean i uh i i don't know why i'm a little stop back on it i i, I think that um i my, my speculation is i think that we're just so far back on you know, the whole cryptocurrency space actually and its entirety has such low adoption as a payment mechanism or as a currency that we still are largely held and dominated by speculative holders that are not using it. So they're, they're the ones that are interested in, you know, proof of stake that gives staking rewards because they're, they intend on holding it anyway. If they can't use it, they can't spend it anywhere. They can hold it. So why not yeah. just get more of it? But I mean, it's, it seems like Bitcoin's actually hurting you in this in this process by having less adoption and less usability in, in the marketplace since they're the biggest one and they're the, like, the biggest name right now. And the fact that they're actually decreasing in who's accepting it just kind of gives cryptocurrency as, as a whole a bad name, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, kind of in a way, like we, we are trying, we're really trying to shout to the people that are using cryptocurrency as a transactional payment method um, to use Nano instead because... I mean, it's self-serving on my part to say it, but I, I do think that it's achieves the goal of currency better than the alternatives that are out there. You know, other people are trying to add other things onto it. And, you know, that that's fine contracts and all, all the other sort of crypto space blockchain things that are out there. But as far as currency itself, um, I don't think anyone is doing it as fast while also maintaining, you know, decentralization. There's some not so decentralized ones that are out there. I think is is, um, is is Nano more decentralized or less decentralized than Bitcoin? Um, right now, it, it's kind of close, in my opinion. Um, there, what you have to do when you and people do this already, you have to add up the total holdings and show, so who is the actual controlling entity on these on these holdings. So Binance is is the top number on there, and it's a large percentage. Um, if you look at the Bitcoin graphs, I, I don't know the pool names, but you know they they also have a very large percentage of the the rewards that go to them. If you look at our pie graphs on the decentralization pie graphs, and um, I think Nano Crawler might put them out, or maybe Repnode, one one of these other, a couple of these guys make these graphs, but the pie graphs are not dissimilar; they're very similar. I, I didn't really want to, we, we haven't shouted about that because it's probably just not going to achieve what we want to do. No one's going to jump from Bitcoin to Nano if we're incrementally more decentralized than it. And we you can get a lot of negative feedback on that. And we're just not interested in the negative aspect of it, really. Gotcha, gotcha. I think that, and I mean, I have a feeling that there's a lot of disbelief like when you say that something is free to use and it's damn near mm -hmm. instant, 
Like people are just going to be like, yeah, right. It's centralized or it's just, you know, or it's, it's a database or, or whatever. Like that's where people's minds go. They're, they're so used to thinking of things as either scams or, or they, they just don't work. So, mm-hmm. you know, IOTA is a good example of something that we found didn't really work that well. They were able to close it down, even though it was, a, yeah. you know, it's a, apparently supposed to be open source or whatever. But um, I think when you when you say something like, why don't you use Nano, it's fast and it's free, it's easy to just go, whatever, it can't possibly be real. Yeah, And then you must suspense. come across that all the time. Yeah, it kind of just suspends disbelief on things. I, I, I don't know who wrote this, but I think there is a, a book called um, The Cost of Free or The Price of Free, something like that. Anyway, the concept is there is a, there's a social thing that happens when something is free versus very low cost and it it actually has some negative things i'm not i'm not trying to talk it down i think there's a lot of reasons why free for nano I'm makes sure. sense but when you offer no, things for free so versus true. like 10 cents or 50 cents people actually kind of wanted a little bit more in some in some cases or i i did notice this with um one of the sites that i go to when he went from free to um just a small cost the quality of his service went up immensely and actually there were a lot more people that were engaged that used the platform. He was losing a lot of time and effort to just the freeloaders that were using the free part. Yeah, that's an easy, I mean, that's kind of a simple way to, to anti spam is just make their make. I mean, that's, that, that makes a lot of sense, but when you're talking about, you know, s- small fees, what is a small fee to us? might be a very large fee to somebody who has no Absolutely. money, right? So you have to think about distrib- distribution in, in that way. And I think that was that was kind of where we came from when we started criticizing Bitcoin. Is Michael, I think your story is that you couldn't afford to get some of your Bitcoin out of an exchange because the <laughs> because the, yeah. the fee was too high, so you were just stuck. No, it wasn't it wasn't an exchange because usually the exchange will cover the fees. Uh-huh. It was I had it in one wallet and I was trying to get it to an exchange. Uh-huh. And I was like I, I can't I can't get my thirty-five dollars onto the exchange because it costs more money to send it than it, it does that I have. Yeah, yeah. And and it's like this is ridiculous. People who don't have access to banking services are gonna like it's a matter of pennies to them. Yeah. So yeah. Um, well, I mean, there was, is it? Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say there there was a a story like a lot. Of, I talked to a lot of people in in the faucet days, and I I did get a really nice message from someone once it was interesting i think they were in indonesia but they were saying um thank you so much for making the faucet i use it all the time and then and then he went on to say that he had quit his full-time job because he was making <laughs> he was making 15 dollars a week um a clicking the, not, the nano faucet and i was like well i'm glad you're making more wow. money please don't get carpal yeah. tunnel but yeah. That that just, kind of, that just kind of goes to show that fifteen dollars a week. This is a weekly salary for this guy, um, mm-hmm. and yeah. if your fee is even close to that, like it's unusable to them. You got to yeah. encourage him to 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 uh, in, invest that that fifteen dollars into something other than just clicking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and this has been my this has been my complaint with with Bitcoin in general and the Bitcoin community is they. And I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I, I want to say this in a way that it's not going to get a lot of blowback, but because I feel like we're kind of in this space right now with with Black Lives Matter, but mm-hmm. it's kind of built on a white supremacy model mm-hmm. of they. We think about developed nations. We think about rich people. Like we're putting all these things first, and we say, well, we're going to help the unbanked. But they've never met an unbanked person. Yep. Oh, this is just this is just code for them. This is just fodder to to help their fellow white people, their fellow rich people mm-hmm. feel good about themselves when in actuality none of it actually works for the unbanked because they've never talked to an unbanked person. They don't understand the needs of an unbanked person. And if they did, they wouldn't be bragging about 30 cent fees, that it's down to 30 cents now. Yep. Okay, well, 30 cents is like the daily income for half the planet, you know? So it's just like, it's kind of ridiculous to make that kind of statement that that you're bragging about 30 cent fees. And and Lightning Network is going to magically fix it because obviously, because somehow fees are just, I guess nothing's going to get ever, ever get printed to the blockchain with when once yeah. Lightning Network starts. And people are like, well, you know, 
if you're buying a cup of coffee, you don't you don't need to worry about on chain stuff. It's like, well, if I run the coffee shop and I have a thousand trans small transactions of coffee, I absolutely hope that it's going to get yeah. broadcast to a to a to a block because I need, I that need money. to worry about how I'm going to get paid. Yeah, I can't worry about it getting double spent or just not showing up. And so I, this 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 inability to connect with ninety nine percent of the planet and their needs, I think is my frustration. And so when I came across Nano, as a guy who grew up poor, it was just like, wow, finally, mm-hmm. what's the catch? Yeah, you know, what's the catch. And yeah. then that's when I started doing doing my digging. And so for the last two years, I, and, and that's when I started asking questions to people like, well, why not this? Why not Nano? And people would be like, oh, because it's a shit coin. Oh, because it d- doesn't work. Oh, because proof of stake doesn't work. Oh, blah, blah, blah. And and I just keep responding like, well, it's not proof of stake. It's not this. It's not that. And and it showed me that people don't do their research. Mm-hmm. Most people don't do the work. Most people don't really know why Bitcoin doesn't work. And most people don't really know why other things do or don't work. Yeah. What are, what, what, Colin, in your experience, what are the hardest criticisms that you get? I mean, what are the what are the things that either people just can't seem to understand, or things that you think might be a legitimate um, issue with Nano? Like, basically, what's the catch? <laughs> yeah, what's the catch? <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, well, I, I'll answer a couple. One, the one that I think is the least justified accusation is um, since is the well. Bitcoin has value because it was mined and electricity cost went into mining and nano was given out for free in a faucet for free. Therefore it has no value. And that I think just is a kind of a fundamental misunderstanding of the the utility of something. It it goes, they're talking about the, um, the, the theory of value. It's like, is it a labor theory of value or is it a demand theory of value? on it did it do you something have value because of how hard someone worked to create it or does something have value based on how much someone wants the end result um so that just doesn't make sense because no. humans worked to create nano yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah like, there's there's always proof of work somewhere like you yeah. said there's a small amount of proof of work in that you need computers in order to process these so yeah so okay so that's one one criticism that you get what's another um I think that we we have to do some improvements on the like you can't run it really well through um, anonymizing services like onion routing. That's more of a, a technical thing. I don't think that an average user really cares about that. Um, well, I mean I, that's that means that privacy some privacy is sacrificed, and that is a big deal to a lot of people, even if they're not doing the technical onion routing. Yeah. I mean, the only other one that I would say is I, I wish it would be nice if privacy could be in, in it somehow, but that has a lot of other implications, uh-huh. both from a technological level and also from an adoption level. The adoption part is actually the probably a harder one. You, uh, p- privacy is one of the most interesting subjects to me, and it's uh, it's something that wh- wh- we've, I feel like we really don't have in crypto at all. I mean, we have some we have some anonymous cryptos, but I, we don't even really know how anonymous they are. What, yeah. it, you you see privacy as something that we that money should have. Some people think of privacy as something that is going to make it easier for easier for people to steal your money if there's a, anonymity. So mm-hmm. uh, you you think that anonymity is is something that should be attached to a currency? Well, like in principle, I think it, it would be nice to have that. Uh, yeah, and it, they are true. It's like there are always the negative things that are going to get um, attached to any new technology. I mean, look at I, I I love the concept of digital money and cryptocurrency, but it has created this entire industry of ransomware that's never really existed before. People can ask for a ransom to be delivered in a cryptocurrency, and they don't even have to take physical delivery of it of it anymore. So that's yeah, that's, true. that's a new crime method that has occurred because of this. But there are a lot of problems solved by it also. So it's, it's a little bit of give and take. I think the biggest issue is that from a, an adoption standpoint, a practicality of standpoint, I don't think governments are going to allow corporations or businesses to transact on private privacy coins. I think they're going to be banned. And if it's banned, even if you can kind of get around, with, around it, um, 
from a like you know we can run this network no matter what and we're, the, the network's still going to go it's like yeah but your liquidity is going to be essentially zero because i can't buy anything anywhere if i show up someplace and they trace it back they're going to be like it's it's going to be money laundering is what they're going to call it so it, it just has a lot of practical <laughs> so implications uh, michael is I'm laughing because we yeah. talked about this oh, really? two hours last La- night. Yeah. two hours last night i called michael and i was like i don't understand how monero is still legal I, yeah. like, literally i was like this doesn't make sense because it's so easy to launder money and we kind of got into a little debate about money laundering but my thing was is well that one of the things that michael said that i thought was uh, way more was also very interesting it add to the interest is that Maybe we don't actually know that Monero is is anonymous. Maybe maybe there is a way for government agencies to actually track oh, yeah. it. Um, and no. and like we, we can't trust we can't trust a quote unquote anon- anonymous cryptocurrency at all. Otherwise, it, it would have been outlawed by now. I I it's really kind of I really kind of suspect it too. And I I'm not a like crypto system designer. Like I don't implement signat or I don't design signature algorithms, and I don't design those type of things i apply them inside of it but it, it's definitely something that i don't think has been sufficiently proven enough for people to rely on it it's like if you're relying on the anonymous anonymity of a lot of these systems uh yeah them not being cracked yet does not mean the nsa does not know how to crack them they, they're very very smart so yeah I, and i honestly did, think they've, they've been cracked already and they just haven't you know, no. like, i mean that's why that's would the, they? that's the rule of spycraft yeah. you don't exactly. you don't acknowledge that you've yeah. cracked that you've cracked something it's, it's way easier to ca- catch criminals if they think that you can't see what they're doing yeah uh, I, I think that was uh, there was like um I forgot what operating system it was, but I think there was a back door that was open for years and years and years. And they knew about it because then a memo was leaked, um, but they left it open. They never said anything about it because that's an easy way for them to intrude in the system and snoop around. It's just the spy craft yeah. thing. They're not going to admit when they found a vulnerability. And then like with, so I was t- t- saying with, with uh, JJ last night is that, for the longest time, people were claim- making the claim that Bitcoin was anonymous and no one was really kind of pushing back on it. And then finally, developers started pushing back and said, hey, you guys, this is not anonymous. Mm-hmm. And then literally within six months, the feds were like, oh, yeah, we started catching, you know, we've, we've caught all these people with, yeah. with Bitcoin by tracking yeah. them. Yeah. And, yeah. You're, and you're like, so as soon as as soon as the, the narrative changed and the community finally igno- like finally realized that it's not anonymous, the Fed kind of came forward and said, we've been tracking this forever. Oh, since yeah. The beginning. So the fact that Zcash <laughs> and Monero and all of those are, are still legal to use in the U.S. should be kind of a red flag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to some let's get to some listener questions. Yeah, you want to just do kind of like speed round with these? Sure. Yeah, that'll work. They're okay. Quick. So, yeah. So Martin asks, "How do we persuade?" And I'm just going to say, uh, and and Twitter people, I'm going to say your uh, your name, not your handle, just to make it easier. So, just be aware of that. Uh, so Martin asks, "How do we persuade the Binance Cold Wallet admin to change their delegated principal representative to a smaller rep?" This is lightning, lightning. Right? Yeah, that, that one, I mean, we, <laughs> we're just going to tell them, um, inform them about the representatives and what it means and that they should, the, the nano network will be happy if they kind of even that out. Um, and since they're a business and they like happy customers, I'm sure they'll, they'll take a look at it and move it. I don't, it's, it's not, I don't think it'll be that hard. We'll see. It is a cold wallet, exactly. cold wallets. They don't like touching. Um, so there might be some yeah. stuff there. We'll see. All right. His other, his second question is: Can we fund the creation of an alternative ledger nano compatible wallet to replace the apparently stalled development on Nano Vault? On Nano Vault. Oh, so like fork Nano Vault. Well, I mean, if you're looking for ledger support, the Magnum Wallet has ledger support. So that's a multi multi coin thing. That's a, a wallet that supports Nano, and they they use the ledger. Um, as far as I know, yeah, Nano Vault is open source. I don't know how if he plans on maintaining it or not maintaining it, someone might pick it up. Okay. Um, and, and really fast last question on my end that I already know the answer to, but if I, I thought, hopefully you can explain it better is um, what's the difference between cloning and forking and why, and what can you do with nano and what can't you do with nano? Cloning and forking. Um, I mean, they, they seem like so, so like like Litecoin is is a clone of 
of Bitcoin and they made some changes like more, more Litecoin and whatever. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and, and Bitcoin cash is a fork of Bitcoin just for the users. So there's a difference in those two things. Um, Wait, go over that again. Bitcoin Cash contains the the previous chain, right? Is that oh, and sorry, yeah. Over. So Bitcoin Cash is a fork, and then Litecoin is a clone. So they're mm. they're different. So I've heard in the past that that you can't. So Nano is is specifically designed so you can't fork it. Mm-hmm. Well, but, we but, yeah. but Nano shows that you can clone yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah you can clone it just by replacing the Genesis block. We didn't design it to be unable to be forked, really. Um, it's it's just a lot harder to fork it because our consensus is not generated. It's not around proof of work. It's around having signing keys for the representatives, and then every single account that's in the system has set their representative. So unless the the reps are voting on your network, you're just not going to have any consensus being generated. Um, so that just makes it hard to do. You can okay. do things like okay. explicitly rewriting the um, the ledger snapshot that you've taken. If you take it out and just edit it or make a bunch of... It, it would essentially be like having a bunch of new Genesis blocks, one for each account, rather than a single Genesis block You know, at the beginning. Yeah. When you when you need to make a big change or update to Nano, you technically still have to fork it, right? I mean, that's just a soft fork. Yeah, we we have a mechanism called epoch blocks um, that that do this, and we're we're working on standardizing these um, a lot because we are a DAG. It's it's really hard to um, do a, a very simple signal as to when the network should do f- new functionality. So rather than having like a block height where the functionality changes, what we have to do is emit these things called epoch blocks. And they, they don't change the account other than they change the version number that the account is on to the next version. Um, so we put out one of those for each of the accounts, more or less. Um, and that's how we do our versioning. So kind of like a plague? Yeah, kind of. It, yeah, it does look like a plague because we, we do one. And if you um, receive from somebody that's upgraded, then your account becomes upgraded. So it's kind of like as soon as this thing goes into an exchange account and the exchange account is upgraded, then anyone that withdraws from it is going to be upgraded. So it is like a plague that goes around. It's kind of funny. I mean, that's pretty, it's that's like, really so smart. Like the world of Warcraft blood plague thing. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's the, a, yeah. I and mean, that's a really smart way of, of doing updates basically. So you're yeah. not, you're not getting everybody to change all at once and saying, here's the fork, here's the new code, here's what we're doing. It's, um, yeah, I think uh, that yeah. was designed by one of I, our, um, former developers at Lee Bosefield, I think designed the epoch or he called it a cap block, but we renamed it epoch. Nice. Nice. Okay. So back to the questions. Um, Draz, Drazinho asks, um, plan future upgrades and how it will affect performance of the network. Uh, I think you're allowed to talk about plan future upgrades and the the performance. Um, or, or you can mention the, the update that the new update, uh, that uh, just happened or is happening. Yeah, Athena. So then this one, we the big thing that we improved on this is we reconfigured a little bit of how the network is laid out for um, less bandwidth consumption. So with less, less bandwidth consumption, we can send through more transactions per second within the same bandwidth envelope. Um, so that was our big focus on this one. Our next one is going to be trying to decrease the number of IO operations it takes to insert a single transaction. Right now, it's a little bit IO heavy, and we have to do more reads and writes than we care to on the disk in order to process a transaction. So we're going to really narrow that down. And at that point, I mean, um, the, we do have a, a, an idea in prototype or in concept. It's not a, it's not a prototype. It's not been written, but we're trying to do a thing that will be able to filter votes. So rather than getting all of the vote traffic that comes out on the network, you'll be able to su- easily subscribe to a subset of the vote traffic that is for um, accounts that you control. Because the majority of people are only interested in you know getting votes and consensus on the stuff that they receive. Um, they don't necessarily care about the other traffic in the network because it's asynchronous uh, through its DAG. But that's another thing we're working on that has a p- lot of potential to decrease the amount of bandwidth. And I think at that point... I mean, we're pretty close right now to what's practically need, needed. We're at several hundred tr- 
transactions per second on on the live net is I think what we can achieve. Once we start getting into a thousand or a couple thousand, that's you know it's good. Maybe we'll want to continue improving it in the future, but it probably won't be our focus anymore because it's um, usable enough as it is. I've heard that Nano is only limited by hardware. Mm-hmm. Is that roughly true? Yep, it is true. So the, the the biggest limiting factor is the bandwidth that go that goes across the network. So we have programmed in um, to the nodes their bandwidth cap per second that they want to use. And the representatives and everyone just shifts their focus on fewer transactions being processed if if they're getting like too many. We call it saturation. Once it's saturated, they just focus on a fixed number that fits within that bandwidth envelope to um, generate consensus on. So if you if you widen that pipe, meaning you, you apply more bandwidth to it, then you can do more TPS. Or if you redesign the networking overlay to need less information to be transmitted over it, you know, then you also get a TPS increase. Okay. Um, Rob asks, when pruning? When pruning. When pruning. <laughs> yeah, so this is um, Pr- trying pruning to... Has- Real quick, pruning has to do with the like maintaining the. Do we need to explain how Nano is a bunch of blockchains <laughs> or something like that? No, uh, that would that would make it a little confusing. But what what we can say is that for every transaction you put out um, inside the transaction, this is different than how Bitcoin does it. But every transaction in Nano has your balance inside of it, so you only need to look at your latest transaction for any account number to know how much they can spend. And that means we don't need to keep a large UTXO set around for the the technical minded people. Um, So when we only need the front block, we can prune anything behind it. But there are a couple caveats in that, um, in that, you know, if we haven't received things or there's, there's various like old transactions or sometimes garbage transactions that sit around that we can't easily prune. Um, So we're, looking at those two, but there is just some easy pruning that we can do. And actually one of our guys made a prototype of it and it was a little bit easier than we thought. Hopefully we'll see as we roll it out, whether or not that remains easy, but we, we are looking at it. We do want to get. So one of the reasons I'm interested in the concept of pruning is that Mm -hmm. when I first heard of, when I first heard about Bitcoin and somebody told me that it's a, you know, it's a ledger of all transactions. My, one of my first thoughts was you're actually going to keep, all that information forever, every mm-hmm. single transaction forever. I thought that's just not very realistic. No. So n- nano, it, the w- way pruning works is you actually can get rid of a lot of, tra- you, can, you can get rid of information that you don't really need, right? But I don't know. It seems like s- s- hardcore Bitcoiners would have a real issue with that kind of modification of your history. But, yeah, it, it is. I mean, there's, this one is like another huge subject on it, but it's like how much, how much of history do you need to actually retain in order to still retain decentralization? And I think a lot of people think you need to retain it all. And my opinion is you do not need to retain it all in many circumstances, but I think that would be a big discussion. (laughs) And then then as soon as you work in anonymity and privacy, it just goes crazy anyway. Yeah. That one, yeah, I mean, what can you even prove at that point if you don't know where the data you need is located? It's like yeah. you really can't get rid of anything. Um, so Terry asks, if the dev's first name starts with C, what's the status of Appia Pay? Oh, does that make sense? So we told them we were going to, I just said we were going to interview a dev, person oh, on the dev team. I so I didn't say who it was. We didn't so actually, <laughs> we didn't say it. We were interviewing Just Colin in case something it. happened. I was like, I didn't, yeah. didn't want to like, Get everybody's hopes up. Oh, no. Yeah, this is... Um, so Appia is another um, company that I'm working on with um, George on our team. And it's a... It, it goes into the payment side of things. So it's a, a module or um, a handheld point of sale that can be used to accept cryptocurrency. Actually, it can, it's multi-currency, so it can accept any currencies. So we've, we've been developing that over the, like, the last two years or so. And then we're um, working on getting adoption and, and moving that into businesses. So, it, it, you know, it's still rolling along. It is a private company, so we don't put it out there and we don't want to, you know, use our nano pro- platform to push our own kind of company. So we 
don't talk about it a lot, but you know, we're still working on it. How, how many developers do you have working on Nano? We have, oh, I think we have 12 people and I would say one, two, three, four, about five of them are developers. Yep, five and are developers. The rest, the rest are like business developers or administrators or? Yeah, like well, we have um, Adam on our team is our, our lawyer and then um, George on our team is our COO and uh, business contact. We have Andy who is um, doing like community relations and we hired somebody new to work exclusively on social media. Uh, I mean, that, that type of thing. And cool. Yeah. Designers, a couple people, just some part-time people here and there, but yeah, we actually have a really small team for uh, you know, what we are. I mean, we're number 50 ish on coin market cap. And I think we kind of punch over our weight in that regard and how few people and how little money we really spend. I mean, even the branding is you're, you're called nano. It's a, it's small. It's it is. to <laughs> me, it, to me, you guys are one of the more, uh, humble cryptos. It seems. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely. guys, you guys don't have Midwest. You guys don't uh, advertise <laughs> on Lamborghinis and drive them through Manhattan. <laughs> no, exactly. It, it, it doesn't help us out. Like, the, another reason why the, the marketing stuff doesn't work is because marketing is a lot of the time, um, especially in cryptocurrency, it's, it's a flash in the pan. It's a, you, you may get a quick boost out of it, but then it drops. Sometimes it's exclusively a pump and dump, or maybe you just can't sustain it. Maybe people aren't interested. And that price variance is not good for currency. So we just yeah. don't want to... We cough, don't want cough, it. verge, yeah. cough, cough. Well, yeah, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, altcoins. That's that's their revenue. Is let's pump the price now so we can have a n- new runway uh, to uh, to get yeah. us to the next pump. I guess. And it, it's just a very imma- I, I, immature way of looking at it. Like, I if we if we did that like publicly, and that's the, I mean that's the brand perception that people would have it on us. If we go to a company and say, "Hey, we want to talk to you," the first thing they're going to do is look us up. If if I'm on stage talking about Lambos, they're just never going to respond yeah. to me. But if you know we have like yeah. discussions like this where it's interesting, it's economics and technology, um, they they really really like that because they want to learn. Well, happy to I'm help. So gl- glad we could. Yeah. Help. Yeah. <laughs> I I can't find the person who asked, but it's a but uh, it's driving me crazy now. I'm gonna feel bad somebody asked um how much money feasibly you have how much time feasibly you have left in the nano dev fund oh yeah how much runway do you have left yeah i mean it it obviously depends on the price the current price it's a little over a year or so um on what we can do we've taken a lot of steps like in order to decrease our expenditures on things um over the last year, we, we knew like a year ago that there was going to be uh, in cryptocurrency in general, especially after, you know, the 2017 run up, we were like, okay, this is def- there's definitely going to be a contraction out there because there's a lot of um, talk and not a lot of production going on in, in these places. And when there's a lot of spend on salaries, but not a lot of productive capacity being done, that means there's going to be a collapse. It's, it's accounting. It has to happen. So we said, okay, we're going to, really restrict how much we spend we're going to really focus on protocol development and get this done um and that's what we've been working on so and how does that work do you and i hate to use this word but do you dump on exchanges or do you like do you do it during peaks or do you just do like a specific amount every month and then have to do more if the price is lower uh, this is a really this is a really interesting question. I mean, you don't have to give us specifics about your business, but a lot of people don't really know how cryptocurrencies fund themselves if, without. Yeah, only, uh, and also because Vitalik openly said that he sold like thirty percent of his of his cryptocurrency at the top, and Charlie Lee sold the one hundred percent of of his crypto, mm-hmm. of his Litecoin at the top. So, so I think people do want to know like how much. And we asked. Uh, um, uh, I'm blanking on her name. Um, ah. One of one of the uh, one of, an Ethereum developer is it Jing or was it uh, Jing? Yeah, yeah, yeah Jing. Mm. About you know what's going to be their business model? Are they going to publish how much they're going to dump every month to to pay salaries or you know because I feel like people are are you know 
money is price is in the back of their head at any given time with crypto just because yep. it is it is still kind of gambling and so um having a little bit of reassurance from the dev team of if you're allowed to yeah. of of if it, is it systematic is it based on price is it you know swing trading or like are, are you trading against us type things oh like, gotcha yeah i, I mean it, a lot of people kind of want to know that yeah, I mean, we first of all, like primarily, we try to reduce our expenditures as low as possible. Um, so that's our main focus. But then just that number um, gives us a fixed amount, roughly, that we need per month. You know, some months it varies. And as far as sales of the dev funds on Nano, we do it in, I just dollar cost average it out. So I don't do anything on a particular day. I think I usually do them in one Bitcoin inc- increments if I do a sale. So okay. there isn't like a single day where um, 500 Bitcoin, I don't even think we have 500 Bitcoins, but 500 Bitcoin worth of nano are, are not going to appear on a, an exchange. We do it in very small increments to level it out. I, I, I'm cracking up inside that you just... Co- I know, you, I you, thought you, uh... of it. <laughs> <laughs> I instantly regret it. <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's <laughs> I was going to let that one go. So um, Jason asks, and this is everybody's been asking this, um, why won't Coinbase list Nano? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they they don't really tell us why or they do or don't list things. It's hard. I mean, we, we do try to talk with them. We've had conversations with them before, but, um, you know, it's just kind of connecting all the dots on it at the same time. Doesn't yeah. always uh, happen. And, you know, if companies if they make a decision to do something or not do something or delay something and do it later they're, they're not going to tell us because you know then people speculate on it or if they can't deliver Absolutely, on it you yeah. can't do it so i understand why and they I, don't want to say anything and anytime somebody a nano reply guy says that i respond to them why would you want coinbase to list it because coinbase just goes down every time there's any kind of you know, fluctuation of price and they just collapse and their fees are outrageous. And I've left Coinbase for good now just because I I kind of, mm. I find it extremely predatory what they're doing to to users in the crypto space. And especially for something like Nano, which which is about free and then for, to <laughs> for Coinbase on. to take like 5%, 6%, something like that. It's just, I feel yeah. like it's ridiculous. I want, the whole I want a centralized custodial service to to watch over my crypto that's yeah, I exactly it's the goal <laughs> and to charge me huge fees charge me huge fee, huge fees but it'll make the price go up i guess yeah. well there's always all right so patrick i oh, sorry go ahead go i was ahead. gonna say yeah we're always focusing on trying to get the more more on and off ramps in all the places the u.s is obviously an important market and we're on crack in there um so they've they've been really good in that area um so hopefully more to more to follow Nice. Um, so Patrick, well, so let me jump to bubble, bubble to G. Do you are are more ex- Asian exchanges um, in the you know, plan for the future? Is that people you're talking with, or are you just kind of just let people hear about it, and if they want it, they want it. Um, well, it, mostly what we're seeking are new fiat pairs, like pairs to government currencies, especially with banking relations, um, because that is what gives a accessibility. People can buy nano or sell nano um, and then get it, real money out of it. What we're not, so we are pursuing that in areas where um, we don't have pair, those pairs already. We're not really pursuing duplication on any of any of the fronts. So if we're already in an area, we're probably not gonna work really hard to get secondary things for a couple of reasons. One is um, usually in an area, there's probably like a handful of high quality ones. And then there's a long tail of um, not as high quality ones. But also what it does is it spreads the liquidity out um, amongst all those people and they compete. We really want people that are making money by um, using nano. Exchanges make money by using nano by allowing people to trade on it. And if you thin out the trade margin um, volume, then they can't make money on it and they don't really care about us at any point so there's a couple reasons why um we pick where we're trying to go and that leads perfectly into patrick lubris's question is uh 
adoption and fiat conversions are still a challenge for Nano. How do we get easy access for everyone? Mm. Million dollar question. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's the 500 Bitcoin question. (laughs) It's a 500 bitcoins. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't do it. Come on, JJ. <laughs> no one would have noticed if you didn't bring it up again. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the interesting thing is, is people are wanting to buy it with credit cards, but there's a lot of reasons why that's hard. Um, like with visas and MasterCards, they have to be very, very careful from a regulatory standpoint. And it isn't just like, always the credit card companies trying to sit on their monopoly. They, they would like to have new people buying things with their credit card because they get a percentage on it, but they have to be very, very compliant. So they're very cautious on it. Um, it, it depends on where it is. I don't know where Patrick is. I thought he was in the U S. Um, so we have, we have some areas in there where you can buy it uh, with a credit card. Um, I think a couple of our services do it. And then also just on crack cracking with bank transfers. But I think it's it's going to be yeah, largely Binance, demand Binance driven. US. Yeah, oh yeah, Binance US, they're on it. Yep, definitely. But it's going to be largely demand driven, um, and that means we have to find the use cases. We have to find the businesses that need to use cryptocurrency in their business, not just as a novelty or as a acute factor. Or we're hoping in the future cryptocurrency is a thing. It it has to solve a business case. And there are a couple of things where that it can be done. If they're doing wire transfers, this is faster than a wire transfer. And it's definitely cheaper than it, but you need a counterparty on the other side that wants to accept it. So figure all those things out. So going back to what we were talking about mm-hmm. earlier about the unbanked and all that and how Bitcoin just doesn't really seem to get that. Um, Lucas with a K um, asks, how do you plan to reach the unbanked, especially in Africa and South South America? Do you count only on community work or are you doing the Charles Hop- <laughs> Hopkinson uh, yeah. approach of just like... Do you travel to these countries? Travel. Yeah. Uh, I see, yeah. Um, well, I mean, so far, it is hard to do. Like, it, it represents an opportunity. I think we've recognized that there's opportunity there, um, but that needs to turn into practicality. And since the areas are so, you know, poor... They don't have a lot of room for discretionary speculative holding of things. So it it makes it easier in some spots, but in some ways, but harder in another way. So we have some pretty good communities that we're trying to, you know, stoke. And then a couple of them have spontaneously popped up in different areas like Ghana or Uganda, um, Sierra Leone. And um, we're we're trying to help in whatever way we can. But it does it does come back to the kind of what you were talking about earlier it's like what do i know about their situation and and how um what they need in their lives one thing that we did notice is that um a lot of the crypto trading that's done there is not done you know online obviously or at like a desk but it's done hand it's done by in person so kind of like a local um cryptocurrency yeah peer-to-peer thing um which that obviously we're we're probably just not going to be able to set that up ourselves, quite frankly, because we don't, maybe we'll get the contacts, maybe we won't, but we can teach like we, our approach is education on this. So anyone in those areas or really anyone that wants to know more about cryptocurrency, nano specifically, um, we talk with them and teach them. Nice. Um, Christian Eichinger asked a question that I don't fully understand. So I'm, I've I've heard about it in the past, but mm-hmm. I don't fully understand. Um, are you afraid Nano USP will be available for Bitcoin too with the upcoming auto bond network by Tixel Currency? Uh, I don't know what all those are. Do you guys know? <laughs> yeah. I I've heard about auto bond, but I didn't really. I haven't had a chance to dig into it too much, and I got I was like furiously writing down these Twitter questions about like five minutes before, so. I couldn't. I couldn't like really dig into that one too much. So, um, I, I'll tweet that. I, oh, if ahead. I if I were, I mean, I could guess. I would guess that they're trying to, in some way, peg some sort of other token on the Bitcoin network to Nano, um, and use it that way. I mean, I I don't really know. I I have a very negative view of the concept of pegged assets. I don't think they work very well or at all. So, if if like that's tether? 
Yeah, exactly. It's like, if, if that's what it is, I would apply the same opinion I apply to all of pegged assets where I'm saying, I don't think that that's going to work. But if it's different, you know, gotcha. maybe call me out on it. So we're approaching hour 50. I don't know how you're doing time wise. There's a bunch more questions, but I don't want to like, yeah, we can, I can, pi- I can uh, tag you on them. Yeah, on, I mean, we can do Twitter that. I mean, want to start getting into it. No, I, I don't want to consume all your guys' time either. But uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely, let's t- tag me in it and then we can, um, you yeah, I'll take a look at it and How many uh, more respond. questions do we have? I mean, I've got at least 30 more tweets that I haven't gotten oh, to. Geez. Oh, man. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and each person was putting like three or four questions in each tweet. Uh, and so I was yeah. like, oh my God. I guess a lot I, of questions. I got to open up the floodgates. I didn't realize, because I just thought, you know, I thought most of the people in the nano community are familiar with a lot of the stuff, but I just realized that, and this is what I really like about the nano community is when it comes to Bitcoin and other cryptos, they don't acknowledge problems with the currency. Mm -hmm. And that drives me batshit crazy. Mm -hmm. And the thing that really makes me gravitate towards nano, the community is they don't mind acknowledging the faults and saying, hey, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to fix that? Let's work on this. And it's just like, it's it's a very proactive versus reactive community. And that's exciting for me as somebody who likes to be proactive. Like I'm the Boy Scout. I'm the guy that thinks ahead and says, I have mm-hmm. you know X number of gallons of water in my house because I live in an earthquake area and I'm just going to be prepared. And it's not being negative. It's just being prepared. Yep. And so I really enjoy that about the community. The community um, is also very small compared to Bitcoin, so there's not going to be as much contention, of course. And but exactly, yeah, you know. yeah. Um, so, but it's so growing. It, do, do, are, can you uh, scan through and see if there's any other questions that mo- are more related to our show, or are they mostly all kind of things about the update and questions for Colin regarding? Um, I guess we can. I think- yeah, I mean, a lot of it is people, and a lot of it is people asking, answering other people's questions. So, I like, see. so, like, they, you know, they helped with the with the Magnum question that that you that you answered uh, too yeah. about. Um, yeah, and a lot so of these questions are, you, are, are like temporal, and no one's going to care what happens in version twenty one when version twenty three is out. So, Colin, yeah, what's yeah, a exactly. since you just released a new version, a new update? Mm-hmm. Are you do you get to chill for a bit, or do you now have to go into marketing mode, or do you have to go into a different sort of state um or you get to relax thank you jj i appreciate it you are looking out for <laughs> <laughs> you're the only one looking out for us yet yeah, no the, we, the we... mental health of colin <laughs> yes um hey thanks no, for we... getting my name <laughs> yeah exactly i um we we did we are planning some dev time we're rotating it obviously so we always have somebody available in case you know we need dev things answered but we are giving all of our devs um time some weeks off or a couple weeks off to kind of relax. This nice. whole release was seven months. So that's a long uh, period to not have any um, vacation. So especially considering all of us were cooped up, uh, I think a lot of people want to get out if, if they can. I mean, we just yeah. have no concept of how, how difficult it is that what you did and how hard you guys were working. But I know that it was really hard for us to to track you down and get your attention. And then scheduling this, I know that you guys had this release. Um, I mean, it, it's one of those things when we're talking to guests, we never know how how actually interested they are in doing an interview. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but but thank you for for coming and joining us like basically the first free minute that you have, it seems like. It's like you <laughs> yeah. guys have been yeah. working all of last week. The first thing you do is to come on the Keyword Crypto Podcast. So thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. This is actually, I really enjoy having, yeah, especially around economics and, and stuff like that discussions. It's really fun for me. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, my brain was dedicated toward it, toward it. And if I did it sooner, you know, I would have been half coding brain and then I just give you yeah. not, not helpful or insightful stuff. So, so, yeah, so our friendly. audience, uh, our audience is a combination of Bitcoiners, sort of anti-crypto people, so the sort of mm-hmm. uh, like no coiners that have a lot of opinions about crypto, and we also have a lot of nano fans. So, 
I think it's a good kind of cross section of the space and the the industry as a whole, as far as people who are following it. What's the what's the kind of message that you're putting out there now? I'm not to put you on the spot, but is there something that you kind of wish that more people knew? Or, um, it, I mean, you're, you're, on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> okay, you're on the spot. So, okay, so, solve solve all the planet's <laughs> worries in the next three three seconds. Go. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I, I guess do so like if you're if I like the fact that you guys have uh, no coiners on on your in your community because I think that it's always good to have like a, an amount of constructed cr- constructive criticism surrounding yourself because then you always are looking at things like, Oh, how can I make that problem go away? Or it just gives you a perspective you haven't seen before. Um, and you could plan on that. So, I mean, I, I would hope I would wish that people would not push away, um, people that are outside cryptocurrency or even people that kind of criticize it and look at it as an opportunity. I know that's trite, but I think that there is value in doing that. I think it, the being toxic externally, um, to people that just don't like cryptocurrency is, is very, very damaging to the whole space. And I, I really wish people, um, I, th- I just don't think we should be doing that. It's not helpful. Amen. And that's like yeah. one of the things we're always talking about is how, uh, how unfortunately, um, difficult it is to learn about this because, you know, if, uh, it's so easy for, for people in, in crypto to criticize you for not doing enough research. Well, I'm brand new. Well, you yeah. gotta, you, 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 you're going to have to work harder than that if you want to understand BTC or, or whatever. So I yeah, really that, appreciate that. And I think we all need to be kind of teaching each other a lot more and looking out for each other. Absolutely. Better stewards in the space. Yep. Well, cool. Well, that was an amazing interview. I, I loved having you on. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks, Colin. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, guys. So, so we will. Um, I, we're going to put information in the description for how basically all of your your you know public relations information, how you get in touch with you guys. Uh, any other resources for how to set up a, a node or or anything like that? Is there? If you want to? Yep. Any other shout you can, outs you want to drop? Yeah, setting that type of stuff up. You can go to docs dot nano dot org and just any any nano information nano dot org is where you can find um and we link to everything there and twitter how do people follow you on twitter or wherever you get followed uh, we have a really sweet twitter handle it's just at nano so oh, that's awesome wow, how much nice. do you pay for that <laughs> i forgot it was a, it was quite a, it was quite a while ago before um I think probably the guy knew what he was selling so Okay, cool. All right, well, there you have it. Follow Nano, get get a node set up, learn more about it, and then come back here and hopefully we'll, we'll get some real, like, hardcore tests on, on the Nano network soon. All right, and with that, I'm going to end the recording. So thanks, everyone. Tune in next time. Okay.